Former CIA Director William Colby, will there be a house cleaning at the CIA as a result of the exposure of CIA involvement in the arms sales to Iran and covert support of the Contras? I don't think a house cleaning in the sense that you imply it, a full sweep from attic to basement, no. There may be a few people who take the, the uh, punishments for having done what they should not have done, but I think it would be fairly few because I think essentially CIA stayed out of the Contra problem and what it did for the Iranian arms, it did under presidential direction. Three CIA officials were questioned in private this week by the Iran Contra committees. They were identified as Dewey Claridge, head of the Counterterrorism Center, Claire George, Deputy Director of Operations, and Alan Fires, head of the Central American Task Force. What can you tell us about their titles? What do they mean in terms of their responsibilities? Well, counterterrorism is precisely that. One of the problems that we have around the world is terrorism. And consequently, we have a section in CIA that worries about who the terrorists are, why they are terrorists, what they are planning to do, and when they're planning to do it. And that's a very tough assignment. The Deputy Director for Operations is the head of the agency's clandestine operations around the world, as distinct from its analytical functions in, in Washington, and as distinct from its technological efforts of the satellite photography and electronics and so forth. Uh, and the chief of the uh, task force is obviously the task fo force that was set up for the management of the agency's responsibilities with respect to the Contras. Now, when the Congress said not to do it anymore, he still was there, but he did, had considerably less to do, obviously. Did you follow the Iran-Contra hearings closely enough to make a judgment as to whether these three CIA officials uh, were involved in either arms sales or Iran or Contra support activities? Well, I'm sure they were involved to a degree. I mean, certainly the Deputy Director for Operations was involved to a degree in the uh, sale of arms to Iran because the agency was carrying out the President's directive to do that. Uh, and consequently, the shipment of the arms, the arrangements of the transport and things like that were handled through the agency and with the, those people involved. Now, whether the counter-terrorist fellow was involved, I would guess he might have been involved. I don't know. It might have been handled outside of his. Uh, certainly, he would, the, the one in charge of the task force on the Contras would not have been involved in the shipment of arms to Iran. Iran. That was not his, his proposition. He would have been involved in anything the agency did on the other side. But as I indicated, that's, I think you will find a few fingerprints here and there along the edge of the line as to what CIA should have done and should not have done on the wrong side of that line. But there will be very few fingerprints and not of great consequence. CIA station is alleged to have passed a message from Colonel North to a Contra leader. Now, if that's the extent of CIA's involvement, it's really pretty thin. How about the role of Bill Casey? Do you think that has been exaggerated? Well, I think Bill Casey had two hats. He was a close friend and supporter and advisor of the president. And he was the head of CIA. And there's every indication that he was aware that CIA could not involve itself in aid to the Contras and consequently kept CIA out of it. At the same time, he knew that the president very greatly wanted something done to help the Contras. So is there another way to skin a cat other than through CIA? And obviously, Colonel North turned out to be the way. And Colonel North was in it up to his ears, of course. And and Mr. Casey apparently had some degree of knowledge and even encouragement of what he was doing. Was the Casey role unique in your experience? And of course, you were uh, the director of the CIA when uh, President Floyd was in office. Uh, did you have a dual role too, or did you confine yourself to uh, simply directing the CIA? Well, remember, I was a career officer and not uh, an appointee from the, from the administration's close supporters. Uh, Bill Casey had been the campaign manager of President Reagan and was very close to him, so therefore there was a closeness that I certainly did not have with either President Nixon or President Ford. Uh, I did the chores of CIA, and uh, my, my job was to get CIA to do what it was supposed to and to be sure it didn't do what it was not supposed to. Is it uh, better, do you think, in uh, terms of uh, efficient uh, 
operation of the CIA to have a career officer at the head or a political appointee? Well, I've always taken the position that uh, basically it should be a non-career officer who has the confidence of the president and is close to him. Because in that way, the president can turn to him and feel a supporting, friendly hand and use the agency much more effectively. Uh, and the agency's chief has direct access to the president, which somebody who just comes out of the career is not apt to have. Uh, you need, at that point, a career officer underneath him in order to make sure that the, the longer-term considerations are giving full weight. Now, this is the way we run the Army. It's the way we run the Navy. It's the way we run every other institution around Washington. We will be going to the telephones in just a minute or two. Please call us if you have a question or a comment. The numbers in the Eastern and Central Time Zones are Area 202-628-2525. In the Pacific and Mountain Time Zones, area 202-783-2727. And our guest is uh, William Colby, the former director of the CIA in the uh, Ford years when uh, Jerry Ford was in the White House. How do you feel about the current level of CIA covert activities? Uh, is the CIA doing more in the covert field today than it was when you were director? Well, of course, I really do can't answer your question directly because I'm not a, a aware of what they're doing these days. That's not, uh, not my responsibility to know, and I do not know their secret activities. But judging from what I read about it, and I'm, I'm able to read between the lines a bit, they are very active and, I think, very productively active. Uh, I saw a headline in the New York Times a couple of years ago that some number of millions of dollars was going to the support of the Afghan rebels. Now, that aroused no trouble whatsoever anywhere in the country. The, the headline lasted one day and the story disappeared. Why? Because everybody agrees. That really makes sense. We should be helping the Afghan rebels. On the other hand, the help to the Contras is a very controversial matter, and that spills out into the press and is the subject of a great deal of controversy. And that's the way we run our government. If there is a consensus that something makes sense, we go ahead and do it without much fanfare. If there is not consensus, we have dispute and, and contention. That is the natural part of the way we run our free society. Would it have disturbed you uh, if some of the aid going to Afghan rebels was diverted to support Absolutely. the countries the in po the, the point of, I mean, if you're going to run covert secret operations, they're very difficult, they're very delicate, and they are full of potential for dynamite. And therefore, you have to run them very tightly. And you have to be sure that you've got some real pros running them, not some enthusiastic amateurs. Otherwise, the money will slip off in all directions. And believe me, CIA knows how to handle money and move it through Swiss bank accounts and take, be sure that they have the total right in their hand all the time and not have eight million dollars slip off into somebody's private pocket. So you think it would have been wiser for that uh, ten million dollars from Brunei to have gone into a CIA account into, uh, instead well, of into the Secord Hakim account? Well, I don't think we can accept money which is not appropriated, but uh, if there was a desire to handle this, there are ways that CIA could handle it and talk to the Congress about how it was handled so there's satisfaction that it's responsibly handled. We're going to take our first telephone call from Pasadena, California. Go ahead, please. Oh, uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, Director Colby. Uh, yes. I've come to uh, appreciate your thoughtfulness and, and also your very understated sense of humor in, in these appearances on C-SPAN and at the seminars around town. Thank you. Um, I wonder, while um, uh, Casey was alive, people were faintly praising him, or, or it was sort of unhappily almost, uh, the Congress especially, saying that he rebuilt the CIA and the morale and, and uh, rebuilt it. And yet, in these hearings, it said that we were still completely devoid of any human intelligence in, in Iran. And, uh, but he has supposedly built up uh, a massive budget and, and everything. And then when Secretary Schultz um, actually said that he questioned and had questioned for some time uh, the objectivity of, of the intelligence on Iran, because the, he didn't say the director, but that's what was implied, um, was interested in, in the policy, it makes me wonder about the, the accuracy of, of the, the threat in Nicaragua. And if you have uh, um, any uh, notion about no. that, and also, 
I've heard a couple of times rumors that, that uh, Casey had been working with Israel to aid that group Renamo with South Africa. Have you heard anything about that? That I have not heard of. Uh, Bill Casey was a very fine leader. He was a risk taker. And if you're not willing to take risks, you cannot run intelligence operations. There's no way to run them totally safely. Uh, he had his views as to how things ought to be done. He had a great impact in building up the agency, making it stronger. Perhaps his most lasting legacy for the agency is that he reorganized the analytical department of the agency so that it was much better organized to do the job of analyzing the foreign problems that we have. Now, he obviously was a man committed to support his president. The president made no secret of two things, his desire that all possible be done for the hostages and that all possible be done for the Contras. Now, Casey responded to that. One could argue with what he did on this item or that item. If I had never made a mistake, I could throw the first stone, but I'm afraid I can't. Uh, and I think with Casey, uh, he did the best he could. He overdid a few things, as you would do if you were an, a very enthusiastic man. And uh, I think in general he comes out with pluses, with a few minuses. And since I have a few minuses too, I, uh, I figure that's about par for the course. We have a call from Fairfax, Virginia. If that is the county rather than the city, it is the home of the CIA. Go ahead, please. Yes, that is why I was calling. Uh, Mr. Colby, uh, Lieutenant yes, Colonel North owns and lives in an estate uh, in McLean, Virginia, comparable that, to that of the Kennedys. And I was wondering uh, how a Lieutenant Colonel on his salary, uh, how that would be possible, and what are the pay uh, scales for the CIA and the NSC? Does those uh, type of uh, checks you get from the government for doing these services, uh, would that be you know, uh, thing to do. Could I make a correction before you answer that uh, question? I have seen pictures of Colonel North's home, and I am familiar with the Kennedy homes, and they are not comparable. Yeah, I was going to say, I rather doubt that they are mm -hmm. comparable. The Kennedy family has a lot of money, some very fine estates. There's no question about it. As I understand it, Colonel North lives in more or less a, a modest uh, suburban home, and uh, that's about it which you would expect of a lieutenant colonel. That's exactly the pay he got, the same as any other lieutenant colonel anywhere in the United States Marines or Army or whatever. Uh, certainly he is not a wealthy man. There was a certain amount of question as to whether he might have benefited by some elements of the money, and I think he very effectively answered those. Uh, the questions about the spending money on a security system for his house and things of that nature that he answered in the testimony directly. Uh, I think the, the answer is that uh, the Colonel North certainly did not benefit from any CIA money. No question about it. He lived on his salary. He had certain perquisites that came out of his position. And he had the security system that he has justified because his family, according to him, was under threat and was not receiving the kind of protection that he wanted his family to have and that friends of his wanted his family to have. Colonel North did, by uh, testimony before the Iran Contra Committees, have uh, numerous and frequent contact with at least three or four CIA officials. Is that a, a normal thing? It's, uh, yes, it is normal. I mean, there's a working level relationships around Washington. Everything doesn't go through the top end of any bureaucratic channel. Uh, all communications from the Defense Department to the State Department do not go through the Secretaries of Defense and State. Now, there's a lot of working level communication around Washington. It's subject to the policy guidance of the chiefs, but you have to have that kind of communication at the working level in order for the machinery to work at all. Portland, Oregon, please join us. Hello, this is, I'm uh, calling from Portland, uh, Mr. Colby. First of all, I want to thank you for serving the United States. Thank you, sir. Uh, we need very many more people like that who are taking a uh, firm hand <clears throat> in exercising their power to do so. I recently read an article or a, a book by Victor Suvorov right. uh, entitled uh, Inside the Aquarium. Are you familiar with that book? I'm not familiar with that one. I know that he has written some others, though. Yes, like uh, Inside the Russian Army. Right. Um, it seemed to give an accurate 
viewpoint and knowledge of the goals and objecti objectives of the uh, USSR. And uh, I want to know your viewpoint. Are you uh, convinced that the communists uh, in the Politburo are out to control the world? And number two, would you please recommend a few other books that might give an informative, uh, accurate knowledge of world political events? Certainly in the early days of the communist movement, they were out to take over power throughout the world. Uh, there's no question about that, that under Lenin, uh, under Stalin. Their thought was that they had the whole revolution. They were going to bring about this revolution and change the world. Uh, Castro had that idea about Latin America, too, that he was going to change Latin America totally. I think in more recent years, the, 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 a more sober view has come in the Soviet leadership. It's primarily exemplified by Mr. Gorbachev, who is talking about trying to reform the Soviet economy so that it will work. He's not talking about seizing the rest of the world. He's trying to catch up with the rest of the world because obviously the free system has been successful and the socialized state-controlled systems have been a disaster. If you look at the world from the point of view of the Kremlin, it really doesn't look very good. They used to have an alliance with China. They don't. They used to have an alliance with Egypt. They don't. They used to be strong in Latin America and threatening to overthrow all of Latin America. Today, they don't. Democratic governments dominate in Latin America. So they are still active. They still have their Communist Party stirring around, trying to take advantage of local problems. And you see them in various parts of the world, like Angola, Ethiopia, Nicaragua, where they are still supporting what they call wars of national liberation and groups that are trying to take over power in their country. But they really aren't doing that well. And uh, I think our answer is to do what we've successfully done over the last 30 years, which is support democratic movements. Where we've done that, we've been successful. Where we haven't, we have failed. Uh, the problems in Nicaragua come from the fact that we delayed too long the support for the democratic forces there against the corrupt and lousy system of General Somoza. Uh, the successes we've had were where we supported democratic forces, as in Western Europe in the 1950s, against attempts by the communists to subvert them. So I think this is the, a, a true look at the problem should not only make us feel not fearful, but confident that we can really win this battle by fo focusing on economic, social, and political development and improvement. And we can lick the communist's hand down if we will work on that basis. And the guest, uh, the caller, also asked about books that you might recommend. Books about the Soviet Union? Oh, there are a number of them. Uh, I think uh, uh, Ray Gartoff recently wrote a very good book about the relations between the Soviet Union and ourselves, uh, about detente and the relationship with the Soviet Union. Uh, there have been uh, several good books uh, describing the internal situation in the Soviet Union. Uh, Mr. Solzhenitsyn has written some very good books about the real nature of the Soviet system. Uh, there are a whole raft of them that, uh, that I would suggest uh, taking a look at. Our guest is William Colby, former Director of Central Intelligence during the uh, Jerry Ford years in the White House from 1973 to uh, 1976. Before that, uh, immediately prior to that, you were Deputy Director for Operations, and you've uh, told us that uh, in, in that job you headed up clandestine uh, operations. Uh, before that, Executive uh, Director, and then uh, prior to that, Chief Deputy of the Far East Division of the CIA. Before that, first secretary to the, uh, at the American Embassy in Saigon. You're currently a partner with the uh, firm of Reed and Priest here in Washington. You're also on the board of the Committee for National Security. You have a BA from Princeton and an LLB from uh, Columbia Law School. Let me ask you, I'm a bit intrigued by uh, that period you spent as director of clandestine uh, operations. Would any of the CIA agents or station, uh, station chiefs under you have been able to engage in covert operations during that period without your knowing about it? 
No, I had a very simple rule with my subordinates, and I made it very clear. The rule was no unpleasant surprises. If there was a pleasant surprise, fine. But if there was an unpleasantry, I wanted to know about it well in advance. I didn't want any surprise so that I could handle the problem and eliminate the problem. And I made that very clear. That's what you have to do when you run any large organization. You have to insist that you have control of what that organization is doing. And particularly that's true if you're running delicate and political dynamite of clandestine operations. Do you think that rule may have been violated by Director Casey? I think in this case there's not real, that's not much indication that any of the chiefs of station were running on their own. There's considerable indication that, uh, that Oliver North was running on his own. But the CIA personnel involved were pretty much on the edge. There was one fellow that did pass that message I referred to who was recalled and fired from that job. Has he indeed been fired? You're well, fired from the job of yes. being chief of station. I don't know what's happened to him, and we'll have to see what happens to that. You're talking about Tomas Castillo, I believe, or I am, yeah. Joe Fernandez, whichever name you use. Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, please go ahead. Thank you. I have a couple questions about arms control. Um, the first one is that a couple years ago, I heard a presentation by Dr. Helen Caldicott, in which she, she cited uh, you, Mr. Colby, as uh, an expert who viewed the Soviet radar at Krasnyarsk as not being in violation of the ABM Treaty. And I'm curious, first of all, if that is your position, or if it was a couple years ago, and if it still is, and if it's not your position now, what has caused it to be changed? And secondly, I have a real uh, mundane type of question, which probably belies my ignorance in this field. But when... Um, arms control people talk about encrypted telemetry. Um, I'm just curious as to what, you know, even if the telemetry is not encrypted, how does a person intercepting that material know what exactly the particular bits of data refer to? And if it's speed or pressures, et cetera, and how are you able to discern what particular types of information are being transmitted? Right. Thanks. Well, on the Krasnoyarsk radar, no, my position has been that it's a technical violation of the agreement. That if that radar was on the coast of Siberia, instead of several hundred miles inland, it, uh, it would be legal. But it's in the wrong place. Now, the Soviets put it there for, I think, perhaps understandable reasons, that the, the weight of an institution like that but probably could not be uh, held up by the tundra along the coast and the the hundreds of miles away from anything that uh, wh where it would be. So they moved it to some other place, which is a technical violation. Those kinds of radars are supposed to be on the edge of the country pointing out. This one was several hundred miles in and therefore covering part of the country, and which it should not have done. The fact is there's almost nothing in that part of the country, so it really wasn't protecting very much. So it's a technical violation. Now the Soviets have first put up a totally false story that it was a, a space uh, uh, radar, which it is not. It, it clearly was going to be a real violation eventually. Uh, they have now stopped work on it. They've offered to tear it down if we will make some changes in some radars that they claim are against the rules. Now, we say, well, we don't think they are against the rules. There's an argument there. This is the kind of argument that you have in these situations you can work them out. But at the moment, clearly, the Krasnoyarsk radar is a violation, and I think has generally been accepted. It does not threaten this country. Uh, the interesting thing about it is we discovered it within about a year of the start of its construction, and that is literally five to 10 to 15 years ahead of when it could be a threat to our country. So in that sense, uh, it is a technical <coughs> violation, but it's certainly not something that we should be worrying about every night in the week. Now, on the telemetry, uh, this is, uh, these are signals that come back from a, radar, from a uh, missile, which is being tested. And they tell things about the pressures and the rate of flow of the fuel and things like that. And the engineers, and believe me, I'm not one, but the engineers, can read out of those numbers the size of the missile, the thrust of the missile, the thr throw weight, all sorts of things about it. 
And it's this that uh, we insisted in SALT II we be allowed to read. The important things that we need to know in order to verify that that missile is within the limits of, that we agreed in SALT II. Now, the Soviets have encrypted some of these messages. We have encrypted some of the messages on our tests. Uh, and we then have objected that they are concealing from us things we need to know to verify the treaty. Uh, they rather ingenuously turned over and said, well, what do you need to know? At which point we had to say, well, we can't tell you exactly because that would reveal what we know and what we don't know. Uh, and we don't want to give you the tip as to what we don't know because then you'll take advantage of us on that. So we're at a bit of a stalemate on that uh, particular item at this stage. There have been offers to work our way out of it. And I think if we make a treaty with the Soviets, we will solve this in the next go-round. Glendale, California, you are on C-SPAN. Yes, uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk with you, Mr. Colby. Um, you. I have two questions. Uh, I, I was wondering if you were aware of some of the allegations uh, made by uh, the organization called the Christic Institute talking about a, a secret network or a team of former um, intelligence officers. Um, some of the people they've charged are uh, Richard Secord and Felix Rodriguez, Thomas Klein, and Ted Shackley. I just wondered what uh, your opinion of some of the validity of that was. And also, if you could comment on uh, the effectiveness of some of uh, past covert actions that uh, we've had, and uh, some of those were in the 50s, like Guatemala and Iran, or uh, Chile in the 70s, and also some that you were involved with, um, like the the ones in um, Indochina, yeah, yeah. such as the Phoenix program. Do you think that those uh, were effective for us? Well, I think that uh, uh, in general, you can find individual operations which were successes, and you can find the ones that were failures. Uh, sometimes the failure was part of the, the operation itself, such as the Bay of Pigs. Sometimes it was the basic assumption and the wisdom of going ahead at all. I would support the fact that we helped the Shah to return to power in 1953, because as a result, Iran received about 25 years of reasonably good leadership and modernization of its society. Now, the thing broke down at the end, but I think that the life in Iran today is, if anything, worse than it was under the Shah. So I really don't feel defensive about that operation at all. Uh, the Bay of Pigs was a disaster. But I offer you, if the Bay of Pigs had succeeded, I think it would have been met with a roar of approval. And in fact, the, we would have avoided the Cuban Missile Crisis that took place on those very uh, fields some uh, year and a half later. Now, here was a failure, but if it had succeeded, it would have protected our country from perhaps the closest we ever got to actual nuclear war. Uh, with respect to the Phoenix program in Vietnam, there's a lot of nonsense been passed around about that. What it was was a program designed to identify the real secret network of the communists within South Vietnam and to give a basis for proper action to capture them, to get them to take amnesty, or if necessary to go out and shoot them in military actions. And we did con conduct military actions. If we heard that there was a meeting of some high-level staff of the communist apparatus in some distant uh, jungle, certainly we would organize an operation against them. And in the process, people would be killed on our side and on their side. But that wasn't an assassination. Curiously, we never thought the thing was working at full efficiency, but the communists since the war have said it was perhaps the, mo the single most effective program used against them. It was much more effective than a couple of division divisions because it got at them where they really hurt their contact with the population, which they wanted to maintain. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a variety of other programs, as I say. Uh, I think the agency did a good job in Western Europe uh, during uh, the 1950s. I think the agency did an excellent job in carrying on the war in Laos with a very few Americans involved, helping the Lao defend themselves. I think the agency made some mistakes in the, in the Chile thing, certainly did not do it right. But again, that story has been grossly exaggerated over what the agency actually did. The agency did not run the coup against Allende. 
the agency was involved in supporting people against Allende for a considerable time. And at one stage, three years before the final coup, they did try to collect military strength against Allende and failed. But the final coup was a Chilean coup, not a CIA coup. And the other part of the question mentioned the Christian, the Christian Institute and named... Uh, I'm not familiar with the specifics of that, uh, of those allegations. Uh, with respect to General Secord, his role is obvious. I generally disbelieve these idea of a great grand conspiracy going on to run the world uh, through some key people, uh, former intelligence officers. Most former intelligence officers are living in Florida and uh, living very quiet lives down there, not uh, in, as retirees, uh, and mainly interested in their golf games and uh, watching the grass grow around their houses. Uh, there are some that are still active in different things. There are former intelligence officers who are in jail, and richly so, Edwin Wilson. And he should be in jail, and I'm delighted he is there, because he went off the reservation and got involved with helping Gaddafi produce terrorist teams. But that doesn't mean that all former intelligence officers are doing that, or that there's any great conspiracy. Uh, Ted Shackley, I have great respect for. He has answered the various allegations against him very directly and very straight. Uh, some of the other names I'm not too familiar with, but uh, I think you will find uh, both good guys and bad guys, uh, as you find over with ex-military, with ex-foreign service people, with ex-agriculture department people. You'll find both. We've been putting a few people in jail from time to time for, for corruption uh, and conflict of interest uh, in agencies far removed from intelligence. This is unfortunately something you get in a large, large society. Do you think it was just coincidence that uh, Gorbanifor, one of the mystery figures in the uh, uh, Arms for Hostages deal, made the first, uh, his first contact uh, uh, with any American with Ted Shackley way back in 1984? Well, Ted Shackley handled that very simply. Uh, when Gorbanifor came up with an idea of being helpful, Ted uh, passed it on to the appropriate authorities of our government. Are you interested in this? I get these kinds of approaches all the time. People come to me and say, can I be helpful? Uh, and I pass them on. Maybe the government's interested in, maybe it isn't. It is not my problem. It's up to the government to decide under its proper authorities whether to follow up on leads of this nature or not. Hoboken, New Jersey, go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, Mr. Colby, I have a lot of respect for you. Thank you. Uh, but uh, I have a problem with uh, some of the comments you made after the Iran affairs. Uh, it seems to me, uh, you just mentioned that uh, the CIA was uh, very, uh, it had the capabilities to gather information uh, in these uh, Laos and other Cuba and so other countries. But uh, it seems to me that uh, you have... Uh, spoken out in favor of Congress putting restric more restrictions on the CIA. I, th I disagree with that, but I have two questions I want to pose to you. Number one, how is our intelligence gathering in Nicaragua before and after the communist Sandinista government took power? My second question, if you were the director of the CIA today, uh, what would it take to you uh, to tell the president, Mr. President, in Nicaragua we have a big threat. Our information uh, down there, it, it states or it tells us that uh, there are uh, some offensive uh, uh, airplanes or or any activity that might is taking place in Nicaragua because you know the Libyans, the PLO, Cubans are in Nicaragua. So uh, what it takes for you to tell me, the president, Mr. President, we have to do something. We have to, we may have to use military force right now. Why should we, uh, the United States, go at that stage instead of uh, 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 helping, uh, let's say, the freedom fighters. We're running a little short of time. I think your questions are clear. Let's let our guest answer them. Well, 
to, as to how well we appreciated the rise of the Sandinista, I think most of that was open information. There wasn't very, it wasn't very secret. That's a question of appreciation and understanding. I think the United States tried to work with the rebellion against Samosa. We continued our aid program. Uh, we, we, we gave assistance to the new government of uh, Nicaragua. Uh, gradually, the Sandinistas grabbed power and stole that revolution away from the other Nicaraguans. I think this was followed and reported all along. Uh, the question is, could we have stopped it? I'm not sure we could have. Uh, the question whether we did enough, I, I really don't know the answer to that. That was during the Carter administration. Uh, with respect to your, your second question, however, about what would it take to identify a threat, I think what you say is the intelligence people are doing this all the time. They are following exactly the kinds of aircraft in Nicaragua. The amount of foreign advisors, foreign uh, trainers, things of this nature. And they report the facts. Now, the question of what we should do about it is a question of policy for our government to decide, for our State Department, Defense Department, and the President eventually to decide. Now, the President right now has decided to, uh, to go along with the effort by the five uh, Central American presidents to try to see if there's a deal that could be made which will eliminate the fighting down there and transfer the dispute to a political level. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to be possible or not, but the policy judgment was made that it's worth trying. Seattle, Washington, do you have a question for former CIA Director William Colby? Yes, I do. I wonder if uh, Mr. Colby could explain to us how the oversight on the uh, secret budget, for instance, and the, uh, for uh, the next budget, the administration has asked for $8.2 billion, that's with a B, for special programs, special update programs, selected activities. And what kind of oversight is it? Who looks at the nickels and dimes on, on this? And I think I, I have in front of me the information from Center for Defense Institute and I, I know Mr. Colby is probably familiar with the large increase there's been in this uh, budget in the last uh, several years. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this. Surely. I, I can't answer the figures because I don't know the figures, but there apparently has been a considerable increase in the budgets for intelligence over the past several years under the Reagan administration. The way it works is that the agency determines what it would like to have to do the, the missions it's assigned, it works through the Office of Management and Budget, to finally to participate in the President's overall budget pre presentation. Frequently there are cuts in its original desires there. It then goes up to the special committees on the Hill of for intelligence, and it outlines in great detail exactly what we want and why we want it and what it will amount to. How many people will we have in Country X? How much money will we spend in Country Y? What kinds of missions are we carrying out? Are we merely collecting intelligence? Or are we trying to influence a situation there? How much of our money is being spent in various parts of the world? How much is spent for paramilitary? How much for intelligence? How much for political work? All of that is given in great detail to the committees. The committees then review it, and they decide whether they agree with it. And they usually don't entirely, and so they make cuts. And then the final budget is set by those committees and is included in the overall budget passed by the Congress. So it receives the same kind of scrutiny that any other part of the government does. It, the only difference is that the review of the numbers is done in secret, and the committees do not publicly, publicly say what the numbers are. What do you think of the idea that has uh, been voiced again in the Iran-Contra hearings to combine the two Senate, the Senate and House Intelligence Committees? Well, ideally, I would say yes, certainly. It would make it less trouble, and there would be fewer people involved. And obviously, one of the rules of secrecy is as few people as possible. Now, we do have to have the Congress involved for constitutional reasons, and I think that decision has been made. But obviously, it would be easier if we had, say, 20 congressmen and senators rather than 40 congressmen and senators. Uh, it would be a better way to do it. But that's subject to the degree to which the Senate and the House can get agreement on this, and I'm not overly confident that they can. 
Dearborn, Michigan, please join us. Hi, Ms. Colby. Hi. Welcome to C-SPAN. Thank you. Uh, I heard Mr. Hyde in the Iron uh, Contra hearings refer to uh, John Runley. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, is an he... author, yes. What, what is his connection None. with intelligence? Runley is a British author who has recently written a book about the CIA. The age, I've forgotten the name of it. I think it's called The Agency. And he went around and interviewed a lot of people and read a lot of the public material and has put together a, really quite a reasonable book about it. Uh, excuse me, go ahead. Of, uh, intelligence. And I was just wondering, my first introduction was the man called Intrepid. Mm -hmm. It was about Sir William Stevenson. Right. But the author was Bill Stevenson, a journalist and a former intelligence officer. And... Uh, Ronald A. says that a man called Intrepid is unreliable. And I was just wondering why it, he would say that that book would be unreliable. Well, the, a man called Intrepid, the story itself, is it's hyped up a little bit. Uh, there are some little extra excitement in it here and there. Whether some of the stories are absolutely true about carrying out assassinations of pro-Germans within the United States, I'm not so sure that those were actually done. But uh, they are in The Man Called Intrepid, as you may remember. A former CIA agent, uh, Frank Snepp, wrote a book several years ago. Uh, he was an agent and a CIA analyst, I believe, in right. Saigon. A book that uh, was rather critical of the CIA and was not authorized. It's my recollection that the Supreme Court uh, ruled uh, that the book could be published, but the uh, profits had to be turned over to the government. Uh, what did you think now of that book? Now, that's not quite it yeah. yet. Uh, what happened was uh, Frank Snepp... Uh, was a very good officer, no question about it, for the agency. He got very emotionally upset by the fall of Vietnam and uh, what he conceived were errors that, uh, of performance in the process. He, like me, uh, was under a requirement to, that anything he writes about intelligence be submitted to the agency for prior clearance to make sure that there were no secrets. Now, I'm under the same requirement. If I write something, I have to submit it to make sure there are no secrets in it. Uh, he decided that he wasn't going to follow that requirement. And so he published his book before the agency ever saw it. And his publisher collaborated in keeping it a secret from the agency until it was published. Now, uh, this obviously was a violation of his contract with the agency. And the agency and the government quite properly moved against him to punish him. And the, the uh, punishment was that they sequestered the proceeds that he got from writing the book. They took those proceeds away from him, and they also imposed a very direct court requirement that he be, be very sure to follow that requirement of prior clearance in any future writings that he may do. Redlands, California. Go ahead, please. Sir, Director Colby, it yes, was sir. brought out by Senator Hatch during the um, Iran-Contra hearings that some members of the committee have said, if you go ahead with this particular act, I'll go public, or if you take this covert operation that I disapprove of, I'll go public. Or if there's something going on they don't like they find out about, unless it's stopped, they'll go public. If, since this could result in the death of Americans or American agents or American operatives, do you think there should be substantial criminal penalties put against a member of the Congress or Senate who would take it upon himself to terminate an operation and possibly somebody's life for political reasons? These were members of the Intelligence Committee right. they were talking about. Yes, sir. The, uh, I, I do think there should be penalties. Uh, one member of the Intelligence Committee has resigned from the committee and was told to resign because he revealed something which the committee had decided not to reveal. Uh, they, they, they made clear that there was nothing classified in that, but he nonetheless broke the rules, and so they fired him from the committee. He's a very good senator, but he obviously broke the rules. Uh, should there be criminal penalties? I think that uh, it might be in an extreme case. Uh, there are lots of things that a senator or a congressman can do other than going public if they disapprove of some action. It's the ultimate arrogance to say that they can stop it just by going public. Now, I don't think this happens very often. Uh, this was a case in which it apparently did happen, but uh, I don't know the specifics of it. Kingston, New York. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Uh, there Director um, Colby, during the uh, recent Iran-Contra hearings, uh, Secretary Schultz raised the issue that the need for uh, for the for intelligence.
intelligence uh, that might best be served, or the need for intelligence being gathered, might best be served by having an agency that uh, wasn't collecting the intelligence as well as also being involved in operations and having something of a vested interest uh, in the objectivity of the intelligence. I wonder if you could uh, just speak about... Uh, right. Uh, this has been a debate for many years as to whether you should have an agency purely restricted to intelligence gathering and analysis or whether it should also include the responsibilities that the agency has to carry out positive operations in addition. Uh, there are arguments on both sides, uh, for and against both sides. Uh, traditionally, we have left it in the same agency. And one of the reasons is that if you try to run two independent secret operations in another country, you'll end up tripping over yourself. Uh, you'll end up recruiting the same agents. You'll end up at competition and so forth, and we've thought it better to be able to coordinate these and make them make sense that the two agencies do this, be kept together. That you really, if you have an agent inside another government, yes, he can tell you what's happening, but he also can slip a piece of paper in at the right time to have an influence on that situation. And therefore, it does make a certain amount of sense from efficiency's point of view uh, and security's point of view to have it run out of the same office. Uh, as I say, this isn't a conclusive argument one way or the other, and there are, good, there are lots of people who say we would protect our intelligence gatherers and analysts if they were separated from these positive operations, because the positive operations are the ones that always get in trouble, that the other ones don't really cause the kind of trouble that we have out of the positive operations. Uh, there's truth to that. Uh, my own view is Let's run them together, but be very careful on choosing which ones we run and which ones we don't. It was Defense Secretary Weinberger, I believe, who said when he testified before the Iran Contra Committees that he was getting conflicting information from his own military uh, intelligence, information that conflicted with what he was getting from the CIA. Can you tell us a little about the various intelligence agencies in Washington and how they work together? Well, the, the fact that intelligence agency will differ on a, on a subject is no great surprise. You and I will differ on our appreciation of various things. And uh, intelligence agencies get separate information here and there and come to different conclusions. What we have is a way for them to sit down together and compare those conclusions and see what the basis for the one agency's is and why it differs from the other and what substance, uh, substantial evidence there is that the one is right or the other is wrong. Uh, this is a highly structured situation. Once a week, the heads of the different intelligence agencies sit down together to analyze the problems that they're facing and to coordinate their activities so we don't end up tripping over each other and that sort of thing. So you don't have a separate satellite set up for the Army and one for the Navy. You send one and then you share the product, that sort of thing that, uh, that you do to approach it as a more logical way. But at the end, you will have a difference of opinion sometimes as to whether the situation in, say, Cuba is more threatening or less threatening. And uh, you will have to just work out that difference of opinion. It can be a very legitimate difference of opinion. Irvine, California, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my comment and question is in regards to uh, Israeli exports of U.S. military equipment without prior approval. Um, as I understand it, uh, ex facto justification uh, uh, for illegal exports uh, uh, doesn't fulfill the legal obligation of Israel getting prior approval. Um, will these, uh, if any, controls uh, be tightened up in that regard? Or will Israel continue to enjoy a uh, very lax enforcement of those regulations? Well, as you say, the, the rules are clear that before they re-export any American military equipment, they need our approval. Uh, there have been a few occasions in which we have not seen that approval, and therefore those have been violations. I think they've been few and far between, but they have occurred. And each time they occur, they are the source of considerable discussion and, uh, and even argument uh, to make sure that in the future they will behave better. 
I think this is a normal thing that you get uh, among allies, among nations, because the other nation is going to say it's sovereign. It doesn't have to ask questions over everything they do. They're going to they're going to say that we can do what we really need to do, and from some time to time. And you're going to have those kinds of arguments you always do between nations. We are in an embarrassing position, Mr. Colby, where our next guest is a few minutes late. Our switchboard is still lit up with questions for you. Would you mind staying Fine. on for a little while? Fine. All right. We'll take another call from uh, Richmond, Virginia. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, sir. Come on air? Yes, sir. Yes. Good. Uh, a caller uh, called a little while ago and asked for names of some other books that might be helpful in this area. And I'd like to recommend a book by Robert Moss and uh, Arno de Borsgrave called The Spike and also another one called Monimbo by Robert Moss. Also, I'd like to have Mr. Colby comment on uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Tager uh, went to Cuba and spent last night with uh, talking with Castro, and similar to the way he went to Moscow after aid to the conscience was cut off uh, uh, several months ago. Then finally, um, I take issue with his uh, opinion that uh, the Soviets have no design and no longer desire to, to uh, dominate the world. Uh, since uh, 1917, 60 countries have been uh, taken into the Soviet camp. And I predict, uh, especially if we have a, another uh, liberal Democrat voted as president, that the following countries will take will be taken over within the next five years. South Africa, which has all the just about all the strategic minerals that uh, the West needs. The Philippines, I think, is is uh, I don't think that's going to be salvaged. Uh, South Korea is is probably going to fall. Chile, El Salvador, and I think within ten years, uh, the domino theory is going to apply in Central America as it did in Southeast Asia. People poo-poo the, the domino theory in uh, Southeast Asia, but we see what happened after we uh, left South Vietnam. Can you uh, put those comments in the form of a question, yes. please? Colin. Does he think, does he not agree that uh, <coughs> the fact that uh, Ortega went to Cuba last night uh, indicates that uh, the Soviets and the Cubans would not allow the uh, Nicaraguans to uh, fulfill its commitments in this recent uh, agreement because the uh, they got too much of an investment and the Soviets have got $2 billion investment in that little country. Well, I do not think that uh, this indicates that, he, that uh, he's unable to fulfill the thing. If anything, it would seem to me that what Mr. Ortega is doing is trying to show some surface indications of compliance with the requirement set by the five Central American presidents. He's the first one who had a, a, a meeting in his capital to discuss the formation of a commission of national reconciliation. He requested the, that the cardinal be on that commission. Now, the others have not worked. They've worked fast. This doesn't mean that he's established free press or free elections today, not by a long shot. And it will be a tough thing to see whether he will do it or not. And I would be highly suspicious at anything he does as to whether he's going to comply. But going to Cuba, I think, merely reflects that he depends very heavily upon Castro's support and that if he's going to go through any kind of motions toward the five Central American president's plan, he's got to get the support of Cuba in doing it because Cuba has a lot of people in Nicaragua who could give him a lot of trouble if Castro told them to. Now, therefore, I think what Ortega is doing is showing a great burst of energy in apparent compliance, and I stress the word apparent, compliance with the direction of the five Central American presidents, uh, and that the visit to Cuba is a part of that. It's not necessarily rejection. It may well be, and I think you'll see, I suspect there will be some announcement that will indicate some surface compliance, some agreement by the Cubans that if this works, they will withdraw. Something, something fuzzy and vague like that, but nonetheless designed to put the heat on the Americans to cut off the aid to the Contras. That's what that will be all about. 
Las Cruces, New Mexico. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Mr. Director. Yes, sir. Um, we talk about democracy all over the world, but what I'm interested in is democracy at home. And my question is this. Um, in our government, there is no document that is more important than the U.S. Constitution. And yet, with the help of Colonel North and others, uh, the administration has a plan to suspend that Constitution. Could you comment on that, please? Well, I don't think the administration had a plan to suspend the Constitution. I think what happened was that you got some zealous assistance to the President who decided to operate outside the Constitution. The Constitution, I suspect they would feel, is perfectly valid for, to protect Americans against their government in this country, but that it shouldn't restrain those, those zealous fellows from doing what they thought was necessary despite the Congress in, in a situation abroad. Now, I think they're mistaken, and I think that it, the, the error was quite eloquently pointed out to the lieutenant colonel by the former lieutenant. Senator Inouye, who made it very clear that he did not accept the idea that an individual official can decide what's good for our country and lie to the Congress uh, in order to keep it secret. Uh, he rejects that as an unconstitutional action. And so I agree with your premise, but I don't think the government has a plan to suspend the Constitution. I think this was an aberration, which we have shown up through the hearings as a thing that should not have happened, as a warning, don't let it happen again, fellows. The guest for our next program has arrived, but if you don't mind taking one more call, we'll take yes. one from Houston, Texas. Go ahead, please. It means I punched the wrong button, probably. And we'll... Houston, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Director, if you might comment uh, within your range of understanding, what took place when uh, Admiral Stansfield Turner and President Jimmy Carter retired or otherwise dismissed approximately two-thirds of the Central Intelligence Agency's field collectors of information back in, I believe it was about 1978? Right. Well, what happened in that case was uh, not the kind of dramatic cut that it amounted to. The CIA had been reducing its strength because its mission abroad had been declining ever since the late 60s. Uh, it had gradually cut some of its operations abroad and it had more people than it needed. Now, both Director Helms and myself had as an approach to that that we could reduce the agency to meet its budget limits by attrition, by just not replacing the people who retired or otherwise left each year. On two occasions, uh, Director Schlesinger and Admiral Turner said, well, no, I'm not going to wait for the three years it will take to get down to the level it should be. Let's get rid of that extra bunch now. Now, it wasn't two-thirds of the clandestine officers. It was several hundred of them, a number of them who uh, were going to retire anyway. But it was a, it was a significant group that left. Uh, it was an attempt to abide by the budget levels and the mission that the agency had. It was a considerably smaller mission at that time than it had been during the height of the Vietnam War and the various demands all over the world. And so th they made, I think, a tactical mistake in handing out pink slips, generating a great deal of hostility, uh, but essentially they did not cut the agency's lifeline or anything of that nature. They, uh, they did reduce it uh, in line with what the mission of the agency was at that time and its budget availabilities. Our guest has been William Colby, former director of the CIA. We are especially thankful to you for staying on an extra well, thank few you. minutes uh, and it's a pleasure. get us through our crisis. Right. Pleasure.